Okay, hi everybody. Uh, welcome to our November Canadian Cancer Survivorship Research Consortium round. Uh, this is Jennifer Jones. I'll be the moderator today uh, out of the Elixir Center in Toronto. Um, I want to acknowledge all of our um, participants today who are logging in from across the country. Um, and we are here in the boardroom at Elixir with a, a full boardroom and our presenter is actually here with us, Norma, Dr. Norma D'Agostino who uh, is going to be uh, presenting her uh, research on comorbid symptoms of emotional distress and adult survivors of childhood cancer. So uh, Norma, you'll have, um, this is an hour, so you'll have uh, an hour to present, um, leaving some time at the end for discussion and hopefully lots of questions and answers um, from uh, people who are online and in the room here. Uh, just a reminder that this round is uh, being recorded. Um, and I will hand it off to you now, Norma. Uh, thank you for agreeing to present this month. Thank you for inviting me to present this month. So I am going to be talking to you today, like Jennifer said, about uh, psychological outcomes of emotional distress in adult survivors of childhood cancer. I work with the uh, adult survivors of childhood cancer. Just bring the mic up. Is, okay, thank you. Can everybody hear before I go too far ahead? How do we know? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I work with the long-term follow-up clinic here at Princess Margaret, uh, but this research is, a, as you will hear, a study that has been conducted through the Childhood Cancer Survivorship Study. So today what I am going to do is just tell you a little bit about uh, a historical overview of childhood cancer psychosocial research, very brief, uh, looking specifically at late effects and in particular psychosocial late effects. I'm going to introduce to you the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study and then present the findings from a recent publication through the CTSS that I had uh, the opportunity to lead and work with them to conduct. So the field of childhood cancer and especially long-term outcomes in childhood cancer survivors is not really an old field. Uh, in the 1950s and 60s, the idea of surviving childhood cancer was very rare. And the focus of psychosocial research was on care of the dying child. It wasn't until treatment protocol advances in the 1970s and 80s that started to improve and that survival was even an option that people started to think about shifting from dying to living with the deficit or the negative impact associated with the disease and treatment in childhood cancer survivors. In the 90s and 20s, uh, late 1990s, early 2000s, we really started to get amazing advances in survival rates, reaching an overall current rate of about 80%. And that's when the focus of the research started to looking at long-term adjustment and adaptation. So it's not an old literature, but it is one that is growing, thankfully, with improved rates and that our childhood survivors are now turning into adults and some of them also middle-aged adults. So why look at survivorship issues and, you know, why is this idea of cure not being the end of the story? And the reason being specifically for childhood survivors that the effect, almost every survivor has some kind of late effect. We know that that is true, that cancer has lasting impact even for older adult survivors of cancer. But when we're talking about treatment given to a young organism and in a developing body, the late effects are actually quite pronounced and it's almost 100% guaranteed that every survivor will have at least one late effect. 25% of them report severe or life-threatening late effects, and the late effects carry the impact of the cancer experience throughout the life cycle and all of their developmental stages. So it not only impacts them during the time of treatment, but at every developmental stage moving forward from there. And unfortunately, some of the late effects can significantly uh, compromise quality of life. So what are late effects? Late effects are defined as unrecognized physical, neurocognitive, and psychological toxicities that are absent or subclinical at the end of treatment and become apparent over time when entry is unmasked by either developmental processes, so things that you know were not relevant before and so were not obvious in terms of abilities uh, that would have been expected at a given age. Maybe these late effects do not start to declare themselves until later on when those abilities uh, would have been expected in age appropriate. 
also sometimes late effects develop because of failure of compensatory mechanisms with time. So our bodies are amazing and resilient. So for a period of time, they can overcome and compensate for any physical or neurological damage that has been caused by the disease or the treatment. But with time, those uh, compensatory mechanisms might fail and we'll have a presentation of a late effect. Organ aging and premature aging is something that has been talked about uh, in this cohort of survivors. And of course, there's also the psychosocial complications that go on with the life experience of being an adult survivor of childhood cancer or growing up with this disease. When we think about late effects, I think it's important to recognize that we're talking about these late effects declaring themselves many, many years down the line. Often people are able to be told what to expect in our research now, our bi biological research at least is able to tell us what treatment outcomes should be and what the toxicities and late effects associated, you know, 10 years down the line or even 20 years down the line. But what happens 30 or 40 years down the line for these adult survivors of childhood cancer is still being investigated and discovered. And we need to remember that in the Diagnosis of childhood cancer peaks at the age of three to four years. So 40 years down the line still represents a relatively young adult age of 43, 44. Uh, many and most of the lead effects of the cancer treatment will declare themselves in adult life and so are not really the business of pediatric oncologists, but become the business of medical and radiation oncologists that are following these survivors in adult years through the adult clinic. Uh, the normal process of physical aging may be accelerated, which is what, something I mentioned before. And we need to remember that we're talking about a tenfold increase in mortality than their peer age makes across the lifespan. So this is not a small problem. So if we think about physical late effects, some of the most common ones that these survivors <laughs> might uh, face later on in adult life is organ damage specifically to the heart or lungs related to very common uh, chemotherapy agents that are used to treat their diseases in childhood. Endocrine problems, uh, GHD is growth hormone deficiency that needs to be treated as they are growing so that they can feel uh, that they can reach their full uh, stature. If we don't do a good job of uh, detecting this before they reach puberty, then we might have missed the window to treat this and sometimes they don't end up growing as tall as they would have with the proper treatment. Puberty can be delayed or complicated for these people, so we have to make sure that we're monitoring that and treating that appropriately in adolescence. Obesity is also uh, a common outcome associated with endocrine problems with, uh, related to treatment again, and thyroid deficiencies, especially in relation to any radiation that may have spanned the thyroid area. Bone damage is something that might be more common in sarcoma survivors, whether they've had amputations as part of their treatment, but also in people who have had radiation to the spine and form of scoliosis and osteoporosis related to chemotherapy for a variety of childhood um, cancers. Infertility is, again, an issue that they might face as a late effect. And unfortunately, a lot of these people with time end up becoming at risk for second malignancies related to the toxicity exposures, either through chemotherapy or particularly radiation uh, later on in life. And these toxicities are, you know, breast cancer and someone who was treated for Hodgkin's disease and may have received chest radiation. Again, thyroid cancer is a common one, and leukemia can be a secondary cancer caused by the chemotherapy received in childhood. Neurocognitive late effects are also common, specifically in radiated brain tumors, but also in leukemia survivors. Some of the leukemia survivors also receive radiation to the brain because the leukemia tends to recur in the CNS uh, in children, so they are given radiation as part of the treatment either to treat leukemia in the CNS or prophylactically. Um, and even if they have not received radiation, sometimes they receive intrafecal methotrexate, and that also can be associated with neurocognitive late effects. The most common neurocognitive impacts are slower processing speed, memory deficits, and problems with attention. 
And again, if we're thinking about going through the school system as a child and or a young adult in college or university with these problems, those impacts also can be significant. They can lead to impairments in academic, vocational, and daily functioning. Some of the most severely impacted may not ever be able to reach full adult autonomy and independence and may always be needing assistance in the activities of daily living. And I, uh, survivors identify the neurocognitive late effects as more limiting to quality of life than many major physical limitations because of the functional impairments that they cause. And then the psychological late effects include the continuous challenge of adjusting to new and changing physical and neurocognitive late effects that can declare themselves over time. Just every survivors often say, every time I feel like I'm just recovering and adapting to the latest thing, there's a new thing that shows up and starts the process all over again. So it's not a static outcome for these young people. Uh, they are constantly dealing with changes that are declaring themselves again and again and again. So they're always faced with the psychological challenge of adaptation to those changing effects. Uh, the potential impairments can be emotional, social, and with sexual development. And again, they're also feeling like they, as young adults, and specifically young adults, they may not have understood what was actually happening to them when they were quite young. A toddler, an infant, a three or four year old, or even if they were seven or eight at the time of treatment, they're not getting the full complexity of what was going on for them. And so when they turn into young adults, they start to question not only what has happened, what does this mean, but what could have been and what would have my life been like if I had not had this experience at such a young age. There's a sense of loss for what could have been and there's you know that need to accept what is and still have hope and dreams to live to a few full potential um, and reach whatever is a realistic goal for them. But that's always done in the fear of recurrence and a sense of a vulnerable future, especially since they're being asked to be monitored lifelong for late effects and second malignancy. So it's not that they ever really get this clean bill of health. A, a small majority of, a small proportion of them do, but the majority will require lifelong risk-based follow-up. And that could be every six months, um, once a year, once every two years, but they're not really ever just like everybody else. So I am going to just give you now a few examples of the early psychological late effects uh, investigation and research in this population so that you can see what kind of studies were being done before we started having the large data set that the Childhood Cancer Survivorship Study has afforded us so that you can see just different methodologies and outcomes and questions that are being asked. So one good example of an early study exam, um, looking at psychological late effects is a study by Christopher Reclitis, who is still at Dana-Farber and still very heavily involved with this line of research through the CCSS. Um, but one of his early studies looked at a sample of 101 Dana-Farber long-term survivors. He used the standardized symptom checklist, the SAL-90, to measure psychological distress, and this is the long form of the BSI-18 that is used in the study that I will be presenting to you, so that's important to keep in mind uh, when looking at comparison of information and outcomes. Uh, he did add to the SEL-90 when looking at these outcomes a specific question on suicide because that seems to be an issue that is evident in this population, at least suicide ideation, not necessarily increased rates of suicide. In his study, the median age was 25 years old and they were an average of 18 years since diagnosis. And what he found was that 32% of them had psych significant psychological distress as measured at, by the SEL90 18 years after their diagnosis. And that is the same level of distress that we see in newly diagnosed patients with cancer who are adults. And 14% of that population in that sample reported suicidal symptoms. Again, just you know, bringing home that these are real issues for a small but significant proportion of the survivor population. He also looked at the specific scales that were being elevated on the SCL90, and it 
went everywhere from somatic complaints, which maybe we would expect given the nature of the illness and treatment, but to things like obsessive compulsive disorder, interpersonal sensitivity, psychoticism, and depression. And it was predicted by appearance concerns, cranial radiation, young data diagnosis, and physical limitations. Again, a host of physical and psychological predictor variables because, as we all know, cancer is both a physical and psychological disease. Post-traumatic stress is another outcome that has been uh, receiving a lot of attention in the literature with survivors of childhood cancer. And this is a 2007 study conducted by Rourke at CHOP in Philadelphia, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. They again looked at 182 long-term survivors, but through their aftercare clinic. They did full psychiatric interviews with their sample and also used self-report measures. Again, a similar median age of 25 years and 14 years since complete, treatment completion. And what they found was that 16% met full-blown criteria for post-traumatic post stress disorder. And they also, again, found that the disorder was moderated by perceived life threat, not necessarily objective life threat, so not necessarily more advanced disease diagnosis, but the perception of having had a life threat. Family functioning, again, this is something that reminds us that it's not only about, in this case, the child who's being diagnosed with cancer, but the family environment will moderate psychological outcomes, and then the social supports available to that young adult when they were conducting the study. So things that we need to keep in mind, and this is also consistent across the literature, age of diagnosis and the specific diagnosis doesn't always have a huge impact in predicting psychological outcomes. They also looked at trait anxiety, which one would expect might be related to post-traumatic stress disorder, but it was found not to be in their study. And the objective measures of disease and treatment intensity were not also direct predictors of the post-traumatic stress disorder outcome. But again, lots of studies show that female gender in this population is a predictor for poor psychological outcomes. And in this study, post-traumatic stress disorder in particular, perceived treatment intensity, perceived severity of late effects, and perceived neg negative impact of cancer on life goals. Again, it's looking at the survivor's way at making sense of this experience that is what is being repeatedly shown to be of importance. And that's important for someone like me as a psychologist to take in mind, that if we can change some of these perceptions, then maybe we can change some of the psychological outcomes where we would not have been able to change necessarily the disease or treatment intensity that they receive. So this gives us hope that there's hope that we can lead to better outcomes with proper psychotherapy intervention. So early on in this field of research, so 2003, 2007, it was becoming quite clear that there were a multitude of factors that were going to impact psychological or psychosocial outcomes in this population, some of them being very directly physical in nature uh, and associated with the diagnosis and or treatment or genetic predispositions for the illness, um, as well as host factors like age of diagnosis, gender, and race. And obviously with time, health behaviors would also impact those outcomes, so trying to um, look at tobacco use, diet, alcohol, exercise, sun exposure, all the things that are relevant for all of us, but including for this population and in terms of moderating their risk-related effects. Uh, aging, the process of aging and growing and development, we learned and saw that could bring up about in and of itself new late effects. Um, treatment factors, specific exposures to surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation, tumor factors, all of these things had a huge impact on cancer-related morbidity. And was that early recognition of the complexity of the factors involved that led to the formation of the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, recognizing that thankfully childhood cancer is a rare event. And even the largest centers in North America, looking at these populations, were not really ever going to be in a position to get sample sizes greater than that 100, 150 um, people per study 
centers came together to collaborate and form the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study. It began in, in 1994. It has been, I think the original uh, uh, centers were 27. It's grown now to 31. Toronto and Edmonton have been included right from the start in 1994 and continue to, to stay involved in pooling data as part of this consortium. And the, there are two cohorts included in the data now available through the Childhood Cancer Survivorship Study. The original cohort were children diagnosed between the years of 1970 and 1986. That consisted of 20,346 survivors, and they've always included a cohort of siblings to act as controls. Uh, and again, what is the right control for a childhood cancer survivor when doing research? Um, obviously, healthy peers are an option, uh, but siblings are thought to be a better option because at least they are experiencing some of the impact of the diagnosis through the changes in the family and the family dynamic and relationship issues, even though they're not directly experiencing the physical illness and treatment toxicities. So they argue that this is a more accurate control group for this population. So that's why including siblings right from the start. They then went on to include an expanded cohort of survivors and siblings diagnosed between 1987 and 1999, specifically because of the huge changes in treatment protocols that went on during that time period. And the protocols have become more effective, but in essence, they've also become less toxic. They have, through research, learned enough about what the critical elements of the treatment protocols were and what the right doses of radiation might be so that they've had an overall ability to decrease both radiation, total radiation exposures and chemotherapy exposures for many of the standard protocols for the childhood cancer diseases. So the thought was that outcomes should improve, or at least some outcomes should improve with these significant changes in toxicity exposures for the newer generation of survivors of childhood cancer. And that's why they went through and put the push and collected another huge sample of survivors and siblings. The study that I'm about to present to you is one of the first being published, and there are many others now in the pipeline coming out, using the full new expanded cohort of um, survivors and siblings. Well, not our study did not actually use data from the new siblings because it wasn't available yet when we asked for access to this data. But soon, and there are other studies that should be coming through that will have actually included also the new siblings and not just the new survivors. So in the early days, and I will say anything prior to the study that I'm about to show you, which shows you a new way of looking at psychological outcomes for childhood cancer survivors. The CCSS looked at psychological outcomes using the measure called the Brief Symptom Inventory 18. It is a short form of the SCL90 that uh, Rectitis used in 2003. Uh, prior to the BSA I18, there is also the SCL53. So clearly this is all being done in a line of research that has trying to decrease the number of items but still maintain the reliability and validity of this measure. And it's been widely used not only in cancer population and many other populations, healthy people, other chronic illnesses. So it is a widely used general measure of psychological distress uh, outcomes. And so that is what is being used by the CCSS to measure psychological distress. And what it asks you to do is to rate from zero to four distress associated with six physical somatic symptoms, six anxiety symptoms, and six depression symptoms. There are three subscales, somatization, anxiety, and depression. And then those three are summed to form the global distress index. And raw scores are converted to uh, T-scores with a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. And a cutoff of 63 is uh, considered elevated clinical levels of psychological distress on this measure. 
there's been lots of research debating what is the right cutoff. Um, but this measure has been validated specifically for this population with this. Uh, and what the studies, the review studies, and the multiple number of individual studies looking at psychological outcomes for different disease groups or in relation to different sociodemographic factors through CSS show that most survivors are well adjusted, that there is a significant group of subset anywhere from the range of 20 to 40 percent, depending on the study that you look at, that show either elevated global symptom index distress and or persistently elevated or increasing distress over time when you look at it longitudinal at each of the three subscales of the BSI. So this issue of psychological distress doesn't necessarily go away with time. It sometimes persists for a small subgroup and or also can increase over time. And this might be because as they get older and they become more fully aware of the implications of their earlier experiences, distress can increase rather than decrease. And it's important to note that survivors are twice as likely to report suicidal ideation than siblings. So this is the general knowledge that we had up until 2014 through the CCSS. They also looked at risk factors. And again, the things that are coming out as predictors are not dissimilar to what were being identified in the individual smaller studies, female sex, is a risk factor for poor psychological outcomes, lower educational attainment, unmarried status, low household income, unemployment, lack of health insurance, presence of a major medical late effect, and treatment with radiation, cranial radiation and or surgery. So in our study, what we did was say, okay, rather than looking at each of these scales individually, and or looking only at the global severity index as a summary score individually, why not look at patterns of survivors showing different profiles of psychological distress on the BSI? And the reason for that was because, it, A, we were not getting very far in getting a better understanding of the variability in the outcomes. There were some studies that, you know, sometimes when you do comparisons, most people looked well, sometimes survivors looked actually like they were doing better, and, and it was like, is it looking at these scores in isolation really telling us the whole story? And we also know that, you know, an elevated GSI can represent many different things. Is that elevated GSI because of one subscale? Are they high on all three? Is it the two more emotional one, or is it the somatic one? What is going on? How can we get a better understanding of this profile? So rather than looking at each one in isolation, what we said is, can we identify patterns of core morbid psychological distress? Do we really have different clusters of survivors with a different pattern of distress that we can learn to understand a bit better and hopefully also identify those most in need with the most complex profiles, and then can we do a better job of matching our interventions to those specific profiles? So that was what we were thinking would be uh, a new way of using this information. And the reason being was that it was feeling like we weren't really getting a good understanding of the phenomenon, and that this might be a new way of getting some insight into it. So with the CCSS, how it works is that if you have an idea, this data is out there for you. What you do is you make an application of intent to outline what it is that you're trying to do, what the aims of your study are. If, and that's a simple online one-page application form that you can get through the website, and anyone, this data is open to anyone, anyone can have, uh, you know, an idea that they want to test out using their data. And if they think that the idea and the aims of the study are valid, then they invite you to put in a concept proposal that provides a more detailed background for why you think this is worth investigating, um, what specific data points from their data sets, at what time point are you going to look at, what methodology are you going to use, and what analysis are you uh, proposing. They don't actually release the data to you to do the analysis. They appoint 
digital analyst from within the CCSS to, to do the analysis for you. Um, and then you hold core investigators being the people putting in the proposal and then the CCSS uh, staff and senior investigators appointed to the project have biweekly meetings and you flesh out the ideas and do the work collaboratively. And then the analyst provides you with the final tables and figures for the manuscript. So it's an interesting way and it's a really, I found it to be a pleasurable exercise working with them. Not only do you have access to thousands of data points, but you also have access to experts in the field working with you to flesh out ideas who are aware of all the other studies being done with this data, who then can also bring insights to the project and enrich it. So it was a really pleasurable experience. So for myself, I was the lead investigator on this study, but with that shared, uh, the co-PI role was Kim Edelstein, who is a neuropsychologist that works with the adult survivors of uh, pediatric cancers here with me at, at Princess Margaret. So we together led this. The analysts assigned to our team were Dr. Zhang and Dr. Srivastava from St. Jude. And we had Christopher Reclitus, who has been uh, you know, a psychologist working in this area for several years, as you've seen. And these, uh, Dr. Wendy Lissenberg, Greg Armstrong, Les Robinson, and Kevin Cruel are the members of the CCSS that are part of the Psychosocial Outcome Committee. So they too were involved on our team. So the aim specifically for the study that I'm about to tell you about was to identify clusters of survivors on the basis of combined distress symptoms with latent profile analysis. So we wanted to use the three subscales, anxiety, depression, and somatization, to identify different patterns of distress amongst the population of survivors. We then also wanted to look at predictors of cluster classification using disease variables, treatment variables, and sociodemographic variables, given that from early on, we knew that each of these were having different roles in the prediction. So when we were putting this together, I'm sitting here going, okay, so why do I think this is relevant? What do I expect to see? What is going to be different about this? We keep hearing that there's a large majority of survivors that just do fine, and then a small subset that don't do fine. But the variability within that subset that don't do fine tends to be quite large. Both when you look at the literature, you get contradictory findings all the time, but also clinically working with these people. It's like, okay, these, the issues might be the same, but the flavor of this person is different. And so just through looking at the literature and clinical experience, we propose, okay, maybe it's the people who, you know, are, it's more about the physical side of it, the somatic symptoms, versus the people who are more about the anxiety and depression side of it. And we all know that anxiety and depression co-occur, but I think in this population in particular, for me, I struggle all the time going, okay, what am I working with here primarily? Is this anxiety? Is this depression? Is this depression because of the anxiety? The comorbidity about those symptoms in this population to me was quite striking. So it's like, okay, so let's see, perhaps there's, you know, the people who are gonna be fine and score well on all three subscales. The majority of the people will be asymptomatic. So score low on all the SI-18 scales. We're gonna have the people who are scoring high on everything and it's hard to know what is really the core issue and what to do with them. So I'm gonna call those people the core morbid distress people. And so it all, it, it seems to be that they're having problems in all areas. Then I thought that there would be the subgroup of people who would be primarily concerned with the physical side of it, so the somatic symptoms, rather than the other subset or subcluster of people who are more concerned about the effective side of things and less concerned about the physical side of things. So we proposed these four clusters, and it was basically really just on the theoretical distinction between physical and affective symptoms. So what we did was use the whole cohort of survivors and the original cohort of siblings that were available as data points for us um, with complete measures on the BSI-18 at baseline, so their first time entering into the study uh, as our primary measure. And we ended up with 16,079 survivors, 9,000 of them from the original cohort and 
7,000 of them from the expansion. So the full category of people diagnosed from 1970 to 1999, um, and all of the original siblings. We looked at the BSI scored in its traditional way with sex, uh, sex-corrected T-scores, age and sex-corrected T-scores, with a T-score of 63 indicating significant clinical symptoms. And then we also pulled from their baseline questionnaires that could have been collected any time from 1992 to 2015, their diagnosis, the age of diagnosis, time since diagnosis, chemotherapy and radiation treatment received, their perceived health status, their current experience of pain, psychoactive medication use, and then the relevant sociodemographic variables that had shown to be uh, predictors previously, such as female or male sex, race, current age, education level, marital status. Um, oop, I see a typo, sorry about that. Health insurance, whether or not they had access to it. Household income and adjusted for inflation over you know, the 1992 to 2015 time stamp. Uh, so the data analysis plan included two aspects to it. One of this, the identification of the clusters using the latent profile analyses, and the second, looking at predictors using uh, regression equations. So I have a slide for each. I'm going to tell you what I understand about latent profile analysis that I've learned through the statisticians, but I'm certainly not an expert in this. Uh, so I trust that it was done properly. And the reviewers of the public, uh, published man, uh, manuscript also agreed that it was done properly. So what they did was they first took the sibling cohort and split them 50% into a training cluster identification subset and then a validation set. So they explored cluster analysis in 50% of the siblings to see what they thought was the best number of clusters that would be identified. And they pre-specified, pre uh, pre sorry, any number of clusters from two to six. Uh, and so they explored all of those different options within 50% of the sibling cohort. But they set aside criteria that a minimum of 5% of the sample had to be included in a cluster for that cluster to be reliable and valid, just that if there are two few people in the cluster, it really isn't meaningful. And then they used something called the Adjusted RAN Index to test the reliability of the clusters in the derivation training subset and then in the validation subset. And then they do something called identify the cluster in the validation using the nearest centroid method. And that's how they did it in the two sets. And then they repeated the whole thing using the full sibling data set. And they kept getting the same consistent results. And you'll see in the, net, in the result size that the, there were four actual clusters that were identified. Um, and then the centers of this derivation cluster were used to define the clusters in the survivors. And I don't know why they do that, but they kept telling us, this is how you do it. And then we said, but how do you know you're going to get the same results if you had started doing the LPA directly on the survivor cohort? And they kept reassuring us. And I said, but can you just run it anyway so that we can see it? And, and as a person who doesn't understand the ins and outs of it, could feel more comfortable believing that this is so. So they did run the same LPA procedure starting with the survivors rather than the siblings, and the same patterns came up. So I truly believe that whatever the statistics may actually hold true. Um, and then when we were trying to do predictors, they used multinomial logistic regressions to build the predictor models. We were referring risks for being in one of the three distress clusters relative to the asymptomatic cluster. They used Bayesian model averaging to choose the predictors that stayed in the model. And we did three separate uh, models examining different classes of potentially confounding predictors. So we had one model for disease variables, one model for treatment variables with age and sex in each of those, three, those models, and then another model looking at the sociodemographic and more things like outcomes such as marital status, outcome, educational attainment as potential predictors of cluster membership 
Uh, so we'll have three regression models. We didn't put them all in one because we know that these things are related and then we have the issue of confounding factors and multicollinearity messing up the regression. This is hard to read. It's just a standard demographic table looking at the differences between survivors and siblings and things like sex, race, ethnicity, age, education. Every CECSS study has the same table in it because all the data is the same. Uh, and there are differences between siblings and survivors in, in every category, um, but of interest in educational attainment, marital status, household income, insurance, perceived health and pain, and they go in the expected direct, direction. These are the uh, uh, survivor diagnosis and treatment info, and again, I think the important thing to notice here is that we have represented in the sample all of the typical childhood cancers or a diagnosis with leukemia and brain tumors being the number one and two, followed by Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, kidney disease, neuroblastoma, and then soft tissue sarcomas and bone cancers. We have, you know, survivors diagnosed anywhere between age zero to age 20, uh, and 21 is the cutoff use for diagnosis in the CCSS. And again, the sample is 25% across each of those categories. Time since diagnosis is a minimum of five years. That's just what they define as long-term survivors and, um, you know, the minimum needed to be included in the CCS as cohort. And it can go anywhere up to 21 years or more. And there's a large number of survivors in each of those time points since diagnosis. We have people diagnosed from 1970 to 1979, like 34% in that decade, 33% of the 1980 to 1989, and the 1990 to 99 diagnosis era. Again, just confirming the representation of the sample uh, for the study with a variety of chemotherapy and radiation exposure. Okay, so this is the fancy LPA analysis <laughs> outcome. I, I've highlighted in blue there uh, the results for the four cluster model relative to the two to the six. If you look at the LMR test across for the siblings, as soon as you get four versus five, it's no longer significant. So adding more clusters does not improve the model for the siblings. To point out in the survivors, when you get to four to five, the p-value is still significant, but the reason that was rejected was because there were only 3% of the population in that fifth cluster, and that was not meeting the minimum 5% criteria that was set in the beginning. So that's how we came up with four clusters in both populations. Okay, when we look at distribution of clusters for siblings and survivors, um, more of the siblings were in the asymptomatic cluster relative to survivors. These differences for each cluster are statistically significant. And again, if you look at affective, it's 12% in siblings versus 14% in survivors. It's a small percentage, but when you look at the numbers, that represents a huge frequency of people. Whereas the difference in somatic, uh, there were 9% of siblings in the somatic cluster versus 14 for survivors. And the comorbid symptom cluster had only 5% of siblings where there were 11% of survivors who fell in that cluster. So again, the story being that most of them do well, but there is a significant subset that don't. And looking at it this way, there seem to be three distinct subsets in that overall subset that don't do so well. So maybe looking at it in this way might help us better be able to identify risk, provide appropriate treatment, and maybe have better outcomes for these populations in the future. Then we just did a look at the subscale scores for each of the clusters. And, it's tr and remembering that 63 is that magic cutoff for clinical distress. For the asymptomatic, all three are relatively equal and all relatively low. For the somatic distress, the somatic subscale is a higher in approaching the 63 cutoff than the two depression or anxiety. The reverse is true for the affective distress cluster, with the depression being higher than anxiety. So when we're thinking about that cluster, I think 
it's helpful to think of it being driven by depression a bit more than anxiety. And in the comorbid distress, all three subscales are at that 63 uh, clinical cutoff. So the clusters make sense as well as we were predicting them theoretically. So I'm just going to show now, and I don't know where we are for time, the results of our break. Okay, really quickly, the results of the three regressions and the predictors by diagnosis, it's this first slide. And again, the blue is to show you risk for being in that, uh, the statistically significant predictors of risk. Uh, for being in that cluster relative to the asymptomatic. So if we look at the comorbid cluster, there's a 26% increase in risk to fall in that cluster if you had a sarcoma, a 30% increased risk if you had a CNS tumor, and a 34% increased risk to have comorbid distress if you were in the leukemia relative to solid tumors, sorry, in this case. Um, and it really seems to be that that core morbid symptom is being better predicted by diagnosis relative to the other two. We had one uh, relationship between CNS tumors and affective distress. If we look at treatment variables, the distinction again, radiation we know is a important predictor of outcome. Uh, and it looks like cranial radiation is related much more directly with affective distress, whereas non cranial radiation, so radiation to other parts of your body, is more likely to be associated with the somatic distress cluster. And again, the treatment exposures are there. This is the first time these things are being identified. I'm going to leave it to the oncologist to figure out why that might be the case. I don't really know. But it's interesting to see that exposures to certain treatment increase your risk, whereas exposures to others seem to be a bit protective of decreasing your risk to being in the distress cluster. So new food for thought, and hopefully we'll help advance the field a little bit. This is the busier slide. I apologize for that, and that's why I've gone through and tried to show you what the take-home messages would be, but this is the model that includes socioeconomic, perceived health, pain, and sociodemographic factors as predictors. Much more blue relative to the other two, indicating again that it's not necessarily the diagnosis or treatment variables that are the best predictors of outcome, but more these marital status, so a divorce separated marital status, less than a college education, and lower income are all increased risk for core morbid distress. And, you know, the odds ratios there are 1.51, 1.28, 2.6, 1.43. Like, you know, so they're there in the one and two, the odds ratios for those types of variables, increasing your risk for core morbid distress cluster classification. Um, health insurance also, having health insurance decrease the risk of distress across the board. All of those odds ratios are less than one. But what I really want to point out is like fair and poor perceived health and presence of pain were the stronger risk factors of core morbid distress. And the odds ratio for the perceived fair poor health relative to excellent health was an odds ratio of almost 32. So these are big, huge impacts. Whereas again, the pain, no pain relative to headache or body pain had odds ratios in the one in four. Female Sex, again, ended up being a predictor that was significant for risk in being each, in each of the three comorbid distress symptoms. And black survivors were less likely than white survivors to have comorbid or affective distress, but no difference on the somatic distress. Okay, so it's just a novel way of thinking about outcomes. We have the same four clusters identified in siblings and survivors, so it's not a you know, a different qualitative pattern of distress. It's a magnitude of distress differences between siblings and survivors. Again, more survivors were found to be distressed, and two times uh, the proportion of survivors were in the core morbid distress relative to their sibling comparison. 
um, and looking at predictors of comorbid distress, again, specific diagnosis, perceived health, pain, female sex, low income, and being unmarried. But I want to point out the magnitude of odds ratios for those perception variables of health and reports of pain. Um, and again, this distinction between affective and somatic distress seems to be reported not only by the subscale scores in the LPA clusters, but also, you know, in the predictors. They're different. And it seems to be the first time that we're looking at brain injury as a possible mechanism for the affective distress cluster in, in particular, and there's a huge literature that shows that depression is very common in long-term survivors of brain injury, childhood brain injuries, a variety of causes, not only cancer. So maybe this is a new way to explore some of the differences in these subgroups of populations and to look at that specifically. So that's food for thought for future research. Um, again, the cancer treatment variables, while the odd ratios shows were significant, they were not really high. The critical variables were these perceived health status and experience of pain, the survivor's subjective appraisal. And I think if we keep that in mind, we can look at and, and we can start to classify people according to patterns, then we can inform intervention strategies specifically for those things. And looking at those appraisals, those cognitive factors and coping styles, and the meaning they give to the experience might be ways to alter these outcomes uh, for these people who might be struggling the most. Um, possible limitations of the study, we have to remember, is the reliance on self-report outcomes? There's absence of information on psychiatric history and other stressful life events that could be contributing to these outcomes. And also, we don't have the, you know, the benefit of having a large data set is, you know, one thing, but the disadvantage of a study like this versus one where you are including relevant variables to look at a question in particular is that we don't have access to all of those potentially other important variables. But I think that, you know, it gives us a new way of looking at these people. Um, it hopefully will give us better, more accurate identification of people at most risk, and then give us a way of tailoring the intervention specifically for the different clusters. So like we said, the comorbid cluster might require exploring survivors' attitudes towards their experience in particular, whereas somatic cluster might benefit more from pharmacological or strategic management of chronic pain, including mindfulness and exercise. And in the effective distress cluster, leading primarily, you know, by depression rather than the anxiety subscale score, might be the use of antidepressant and more traditional CBT for depression uh, interventions. So this is what we think we have learned from this study and how this information could be used. And that's it. Great.